then our special guest who uh, I think you might know has saved humanity many times, now is working on uh, the future of film. Uh, the host and film scholar Keanu Reeves is here. Oh, thank you guys. And then we'll do a Q&A right after these guys talk about the making of this film and whether it was shot on digital. All right. Well, thank you all for staying all the way to the end. Appreciate it. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions. Um, now would be the time to ask them. We can try to answer them. Uh, that's actually a good question. Um, you know, for, we don't really cover documentaries at all. Uh, basically covered, you know, Hollywood movies or movies that um, had the ability to sort of choose whatever they wanted. With a documentary like this that was low budget, it was a, a tiny crew. It was Keanu and I and a cameraman and a producer, you know, running around setting up uh, camera really quickly and shooting folks like Wally, you know, unexpectedly for about 40 minutes and then moving somewhere else and, and shooting. And, and with film, I just don't think we would have been able to achieve that or shoot the long takes, which I think lent it sort of a kind of a conversational feel, you know, the way when Keanu's talking to people, they could really get into things and, and make them feel relaxed. And I don't know if we would have been able to do that with film. rapidly changing landscape since you wrapped the film? Uh, how long did we start shooting? Uh, we started around uh, end of summer, fall of 2010. And uh, we stopped, I guess, about a year and it was about 18 months, I guess, yeah. when Chris Keneally finally told me to stop interviewing people. <laughs> um, with this topic, and, and, and it's so broad, and it impacts in so many different areas um, we had eventually to stop um, but and then a lot has changed a lot has changed um, just in terms of dealing with the cameras that we speak about here um, you know there's been you know the red the red epic is out now um, the airy studio cameras out now um, and I guess just the development to me one of the things that's that I enjoy about your documentary, Chris, is that it, it's really, it covers this kind of, what I, we always looked at it as this kind of crossroads in time, you know, this revolution, evolution, and looking back at, you know, what did we lot, what are we losing, what are we gaining, where are we now, where might we be going, and I think some of the things that are cool about this documentary is the questions it asks, like what is the new audience, what is the new projection, what is the new storytelling, um, and I, I guess that's kind of what you guys are doing here you know, talking about that, living in that world. And I think, and that goes to digital distribution, you know, the different ways that we're seeing content now, and obviously how we're creating content um, with documentaries. I mean, when we look back at these days, uh, documentaries and different ways of, of the content that we're creating in such different narrative forms, or old new ways, I guess. Um, and, and I think just the expense and the availability of the tools. Um, what, you know, in terms of the technology of film and digital, I think there's always going to be that and that, personally. Um, but that evolution, you know, 4K, 60 frames, 120 frame, you know, all of that, color space and how that's developing um, is certainly coming along. And uh, digital projections coming along, laser projectors are coming along. Um, but I'll let Mr. Fister talk about that. <laughs> um, and, and the taste and how, you know, what... And I think also what, the, what I'm meeting with... I'm sorry I'm talking about this. But um, just the, the... If we were having this conversation two years ago, it would be very different than what we're going to talk about today. It seems like the, the mindset or how we're dealing with what's changing, we've had some time with it now. 
um, so that all of these changes that are coming still, I think they'll be a little, it's less impactful in, in a way in terms of the destruction, you know, the carnage that, that's been left on, you know, that, that was created um, in a way, you know, the transition of obviously Technicolor, Kodak, all of the, the resources and, and, and people that used to timers, everything like that. Um, and that's, that's part of the, what have we lost? So Matrix was so revolutionary with CGI and digital. When you shot that, were you questioning it at the time? And is that what propelled you to want to be a part of this? And did it change your mind? Uh, my mind is uh, pretty flexible. But uh, in terms of, you know, I, it, really, it really impacted me on the second and third films, actually more than the first. The first was... Uh, the first was really exciting in the sense of uh, bullet time. You know, it's taking still images and creating, you know, uh, moving camera and, and object at different speeds and the, the backgrounds. You know, kind of a, a, a precursor of photogrammetry. Um, and, but I remember when I was dealing with this one room where we were, they were going to do an artificial Neo. Um, and it was, uh, had all of this Sony, you know, hard drives. It was in a dark room. All you could hear was the hum and feel the heat of these data collectors. You know, then, back then, a, you know, a terabyte was a big deal. It was like bigger than going to the moon. You know, it's like, there's five terabytes in this room. <laughs> and I had like, you know, 30 cameras around me. And um, I remember talking to John Gaeta coming out of that saying, my job is to give flesh to the machine. You know, um, and it was part of that, that response of, of becoming um, represented, representation of the real. Um, as far as the, like, Wally, you mentioned that you would be uh, and Christopher Nolan be one of the last ones shooting on film, but with um, with all the like film makers and film stocks specifically, you mentioned in the movie that the cameras were not being made anymore. But what about the fact that the film stock's not being made anymore? Cause, uh, well, <laughs> for how long though is what I'm wondering. Because okay. Except from Fuji. Yeah, I was, that's what I was going to say. Fuji just went out of business. So. By, by a little bit. But it's getting, you know, it's getting harder and harder for filmmaking companies because a lot of their um, business was to make the actual prints at the very end, which go around to the theaters, and that's really going away. So now, at, if, if anything, they're only on the front end of the capture, so the business is getting smaller and, and smaller. So. Can you guys talk about how you came to decide to make this movie together and, and how that came about? Maybe this mic's better. Yeah, so uh, we were working on a movie called Henry's Crime that Kiana was in and produced, and I was the post-production supervisor on it. So a lot of the discussions and, and questions and things that the doc covers were things Keanu and I were talking about kind of just day to day while, while we were working together, and he'd seen... Um, another documentary I made about competitive eating, which is much different than this, <laughs> but he said, uh, hey, we should make a movie about, you know, film and digital, and do you want to do it? And uh, of course I said, yeah, let's, let's do it. And then I went home and I'm like, nobody's going to want to see this movie. What are we going to do? But we, we kind of came up with a list of people we wanted to talk about and things we wanted to cover, and, you know, that's kind of how it started. For me, emotionally, too, it was about based on about the end of film. You know, we were, this one particular day we were in the DI room um, and we were looking at this one moment where you've taken the photochemical, you've digitized it, you've colored the digital, and now you've got to match the digital image to the photochemical image. And behind you, you have a timer and a colorist. And they both talk about color space in different ways. And they were side by side. And I was looking at this image side by side. And and the cinematographer we were working with was showing me images on a 5D that he shot for a commercial and the director's talking about, you know, film and digital and, 
And, and I was just thinking, wow, film is going away. This is all going away. And that emotionally is where kind of I, I came out of that, just trying to document this transition. So, uh, so after that, did you say, okay, we want to make this film and there are, are these directors, like we have to have James Cameron because of Avatar, or we have to have George Lucas because of Star Wars, Phantom Menace, or how did, that, how did you figure out who to ask to be in it? Yeah, there were, there were certain people you have to have. You know, we started researching, you know, and seeing sort of how this, um, the, the digital technology sort of crept in or, or became part of the movie making world and try to figure out sort of what were the milestone movies, what were the milestone technological advances, who were the artists that used certain things, and, and yeah, we made a list and decided to go after people, and you know, Wally and, and Christopher Nolan were people we were trying to get for a long time. Um, the Anthony Dodd Mantle story sort of unfolded just through research, and we're like, it's kind of every major digital milestone, you know, you go on IMDb and find out who the DP was, and it was it was Anthony Dodd Mantle. Oh, he did, you know, the Dogma films, and then he did, um, uh, you know, Slumdog Millionaire, and he did Antichrist, and, and all these these movies kept coming up. And we're like, we have to track this guy down. But one of the first shoots we did was at Camera Image, which is a um, film festival in Poland for cinematographers, and uh, Wally, and you know, Storaro, and Vilmos, and, and all these, you know, huge icons of cinematography are just there, trapped in a little building with a blizzard outside, drinking vodka. <laughs> so so we, you could, we bum rushed the festival. <laughs> Basically, that's what happened. We just grabbed people and they had nothing else to do and they were half drunk and stuck a camera in their face, started asking them questions. And that was really the beginning of it. And we, we learned a lot just from those early interviews about really what the movie was, was going to become. Apparently everybody said yes, though. Did anyone say no? Yeah. Names? No. <laughs> All right, next question. Hi. Um, one topic that occurs to me afterwards, and you know, I'm sure everyone in here is a filmmaker, and um, one thing that perhaps was, maybe you thought was out of the scope of the film itself, but if both of you could speak to it, as far as the audience's reception, because I feel at the end of the day, they're our boss. So, you know, what if you've experienced um, that personally, but also in the terms of making the film? Yeah, it's, it's funny. I think people are different. The audience, you know, everybody watches movies. There's some people that can go in, into it and they think they can tell the difference between film and digital at other Q and A's, you know, people have told me it's not even the same thing. Something that's shot on digital can't even be considered the same art form as something shot on film. You know, I, I, I don't think I would agree with that. But you know, some people are very particular. Other people, I think, they go to movie and it's just the story and the actors and you know, maybe subconsciously they take in the visuals and things like that. But to me, it's I, I really think it's it's just it's another tool and I, I don't know if, if, the, if how much the audience can really tell what something has been shot on, you know? Yeah, but when we, even when we do Q&As and stuff and we were talking to people, you know, we would get that like, we don't care. And then we would get like, we really care, you yeah. know, in the sense of like, what it is, you know? Um, um, real quick, I was curious if the conversation ever arose about IMAX film. Um, I thought maybe uh, Christopher Nolan might have had something to say about that because the, the first three shots of The Dark Knight Rises and when I went to IMAX, it was just incredible. And it just seems like that's always going to be the sort of ace in the deck, you know, that film has to trump digital, perhaps. Yeah. Probably a big topic, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, it, absolutely, right now, absolutely. I think his sensor size has changed. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, texturally, and, and I don't know if you saw, a, you know, a digital projection or a filmic photochemical. Yeah, um, yeah, there's so much. I mean, scope-wise, you know, digital will definitely have bigger sensors and, you know, all of that, and you'll get all of that. 
So, uh, you know, I don't think Lucy is actually here, and there are three seats left. What if we just bring the other guys up and join you? How about that? So we got Wally Pfister, uh, a, a new up-and-comer. He's just about to direct his first film with uh, this other up-and-comer named Johnny Depp, I think. Uh, Chris Robinson, one of the most prolific, amazing video, music video, commercial directors, filmmakers, Jay-Z, every favorite video you've ever seen. Uh, Rodney Charters, two-time Emmy Award uh, nominee, uh, sh shoots Shameless, 24, directing uh, as well now. Uh, lucky to have them all. Next question. So uh, what's the uh, plans to have other people get to see it? I have a lot of friends who I think would be really interested. Uh, as far as digital distribution, will this be uh, on iTunes, or is it going to be uh, going to the Film uh, Fest circuit, or how can other people see this movie? Uh, the movie, it's kind of gone through the film festivals, at least in the U.S. It's hitting a lot of foreign film festivals right now. It's kind of going on a tour of America. We already had a couple weeks in L.A., a couple weeks in New York. Um, and it's on iTunes, it's on Amazon, it's on demand on your cable, and it's on Voodoo, I believe. I'm not sure what that is, but it's on Voodoo. <laughs> so it's being digitally distributed. And uh, so your friends can see it. The IMAX. <laughs> what was the question? Sorry. Is it where where technology is heading? Is it? Uh, I, I, I don't think anybody can predict exactly where it's going in the future, um, but we can talk about where it was. Um, and going back just a, a beat to the, the, the conversation about IMAX, um, one of the reasons that Nolan and I started shooting things on IMAX and we shot the first seven minutes of um, Dark Knight on IMAX and ended up shooting a total 28 minutes uh, in that film, and then on Dark Knight Rises, did a, a, over an hour of IMAX, native IMAX footage. And what Chris really brought up when we initially started testing for it um, was that it, it's still, from an exhibition standpoint, it's the most immersive experience going into an IMAX theater. The, the, the theater in, in New York and um, Columbus Circle is 100 feet wide and um, uh, I don't know what 80 feet higher 90 feet high or something and it's a it's a phenomenal immersive experience when you're right in the middle and it's filling your peripheral vision and the sound is really unique in an IMAX theater as well so that really is what Chris wanted to do with these big you know epic kind of films and um, and IMAX uh, 65 millimeter negative is really the only format you can blow up. And IMAX does have digital theaters now, but they really don't hold up at all compared to their film, uh, their original film cameras and, and, and the 65 millimeter negative. Um, just as an example, in comparison to um, anamorphic 35, it's nine times the negative size. Um, and 35 millimeter, um, Anamorphic is considered between 8 and 12K. So when these newer cameras, the red camera, you see that it's going from 4K to 5K, and, they're, and a lot of these cameras are 2K, you know, 35 millimeter anamorphic, as I said, is still between 8 and 12K. And that's not really even factoring in the, the physical depth of the film itself. Um, so it's not a matter of any kind of, you know, uh, a race except that what we've always wanted before we cave to, to digital is to have it get up to our standards and to have it get to a level where uh, we feel it does compete with, uh, with film. And so in terms of where the future is headed, they've been trying to 
capture a resolution similar to film, you know, the last 20 or 30 years. So uh, I would imagine they continue doing it. But it would be a real shame to see our film go away before they at least get equal to the resolution of film. I really don't know. Uh, there is a, a new system from Dolby called Atmos, which is going to be released in a few cinemas with the screening of Life of Pi. It was one of the first features. And they have 32 speakers in every theater, including arrays across the roof. And uh, my son worked on it in Taiwan and saw the screening yesterday or the day before. And he said it was absolutely extraordinary because now you can play with a complete, completely immersive sound field where you, you can put sound wherever you want. And they're having, I think he said they had 128 channels and it's digitally designed to assign the sound to a particular speaker very precisely at the time that you want it to and then it can go away. And so that's, that's the beginning of sound at that level. I, I, one of the things I was, we shot 24 on film right to the bitter end, despite Fox uh, accusing me of costing them another half million dollars a year in film stock at the end of that season. Um, I was glad we did, but it was a very, very sad moment when we closed the gate on the last roll and, and most of us knew we'd probably never shoot film again. I, I don't think that's true of the whole crew, but I think for most of it, it probably is. Um, but one of the things that I found about the digital transition was the way in which sharpness was perceived on the plane of the digital chip. There was no grace at all. And when you actually expose film to a, ne a negative emotion, you're dealing with three layers. And there is this grace where focus can be in the red layer and then it can shift to the other layer and so on. So a close-up has a generous amount of, of uh, almost an organic quality about it because you're dealing with silver halide and it's something that's chemical and it's not as precise as the chip acquisition and we had a lot of trouble with that because when you went out of focus in digital you really went out whereas there was always that kind of generous period and I'm wondering now that as we shift towards higher levels of acquisition in digital and I think there were some tests done on the Hobbit in 3D here where at 48 frames people were feeling that we'd gone beyond the suspension of disbelief and there was no longer a process in which you were just immersed and taken on a journey that in fact you were taken out of the journey and they've had to rethink possibly, I don't know, the release is imminent whether or not they've gone back to 24 frame uh, distribution or whether there are going to be any 48 frame tests and so all of that is in the future and I, I think film still continues to give you that ability to lose yourself instantly but I'm not so sure uh, about the digital files it's interesting now when you go to a film that was exposed on film and projected uh, possibly on film there are still a few theaters around it's not as satisfying an experience as it is if it's a digital print. It's much more satisfying for me. I don't see the dirt. I don't see the waving. I can pretty well guarantee that the print is as it was last seen by the cinematographer and the color timer. But in the process of going there, we have opened up a whole box of worms where cinematographers no longer have the control that they used to have. It was a very simple process. Now it's very complex and you saw them working with the Da Vinci. On the other hand, you can now download a free copy of Da Vinci which will give you all of this technology if you have the time to learn the process and actually execute it. And I'm going through a process now with Shameless this season where I'm on a remote location and I'm being fed files and I don't like the colorists and I lost my old colorist and, and I tried to do it myself but I can't be here and the producers have taken it over and said no we want to make it look more like the first season which was interestingly shot on the red the red one camera so there's a whole process where there was a look about the show in the first season that the producers wanted to go back to because on the Alexa we made it a little bit more beautiful and they really wanted to downgrade it and grunge it and so I'm having that little bit of a struggle. But those are the problems for us as we move into the digital future. And, um, but anyhow, I've said enough. Bring up uh, Paul Corver to moderate a little bit. He's got a post-production company uh, uh, that does film and digital 4K uh, theater and is a perfect moderator. Chris, I was going to ask you, 
and you've done so much innovative work in uh, your music videos. Uh, did you start in film and are now using digital, or where do you stand? Yeah, we always we started in film. You know, back when you just tried to get some 16 to shoot. You know, I used to shoot everything. I still think I'm young and cool, but I used to shoot everything on like a VHS camera that my dad had, and I used to cut on a, a, a roller system. So it was videotape to videotape, and you know, then we got to 16. And once you get, you know, and you know, our thing was once we get into feeling professional, all of us, and, and we've made it, is when we got to shoot 35 for the first time. So, you know, for 15 years I've shot 35. So much so that every treatment that I wrote, every job I had, I had a, a pat paragraph at the end that said we will shoot in 35 millimeter for crisp, clear, beautiful images. Like it be, almost became a joke with the commissioners that, that they knew what the last paragraph would say. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm like uh, in the Wally school and, you know, all, basically all my producers are like, it will cost us 10,000 more dollars to shoot 35. But there's a whole post-production uh, uh, way of, of, thing, of doing things that takes time and it takes money. So it's a, it, it does cost a little bit more to shoot film and I think it's worth it. But it's a bit of a misnomer as well because we, we have shot film for 100 years and they got it dialed in and everybody knows it from the guy in the lab to the guy who's shipping your stuff out to you know Dave Hussey at Company 3 you know you know and there's a there's a there's a bit of a ballet to it you know we shoot we come back from whatever location we know we're going to go set at Company 3 and eat Bay Cities and talk about it and and give it a certain look and maybe the idea we had on uh set is different and you had a lot of leeway in that film. We had a lot of uh, ability, you know, it, obviously it's what we, we started out to do is what we, you know, is, is what the goal was, but sometimes you found some magic that for me, you lose a little bit once you get into uh, the red. Because my DP was like a red disciple. So we went there and I experimented with red and then the Alexa. So now, the DPs are, are swearing by Alexas. And I use both of them. You know, I, I'll, you know, and Alexa costs a little bit more to use than the red. And now, you know, but, you know, it is a very interesting documentary. I was, you know, watching it as a fan going, wow, this is crazy because we are in the middle of this revolution and it's happening right before us. And for me as a director, you know, my son's here, he's a director. When I talk to all the young guys, you know, they're not just storytellers, they're also like a, a scientist, you know. Every young director that comes up to me is like, yeah, well I'm using this camera and it has this and it does, it does that and then the color separation, I'm like, really? Like, I, I couldn't even put a spool of film into a camera because I was always focused on story. but. I say that to say it's all changing. You know, the way a director thinks and what he's going to use to tell his story is now part of that, that story too, and, and of what he gives to the audience. And so my latest experiment is I shot a Prince video. He does still shoot videos, <laughs> although he may never put it out. We went to Minnesota and I said, you know what? He expects 35. So I'm going to shoot 35, and I shot the red, and I shot the 5D, and I shot 16 reversal, uh, hand cranked, and we shot it, you know, we shot the whole video with these four, and then I was able to just set back and look at it all in the telecine, and 35 is the best, red second. <laughs> 16 is just amazing because we shot with a hand crank camera and then the 5D but I know Wally knows you may know but I don't know if the audience will know you know the difference of the cameras so yeah video film video and I fight my producers every day to keep shooting film
two advantages. I um, I thought it was interesting that John Malkovich was saying, you know, I get so bored on the set, can't we go, can't we go, right? And then Robert Downey Jr. is like, man, I'm so tired, they keep working me, man. keep working me. From your perspective, and maybe other actors' perspective, what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages? And again, not to go on about it, it seems like with film, the fact that it's precious, you would stop, and maybe the director is a little bit more hard-targeted about his direction. Sometimes when you can roll and roll and roll, there are happy accidents, you can experiment, but also there's also sometimes a sloppiness in terms of the direction you get. So from an actor's standpoint, what works better for you, uh, film or digital? Kind of in a way that you've just asked the question is kind of the answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the sense that every job is different, every situation is unique. Um, and it's not a situation that you can really contrast and compare. You know, I can't say what it was like to do this film like this and then, you know, photochemical and then this is digital. Um, it really depends because, you know, um, as uh, Rick Linklater says, if you want to adopt a discipline to a digital floor, you can um, or not. Um, but uh, um, it really is just the rhythm. You know, just the, it's just the rhythm of how when you have to change. You mean you, you end up in that same spot sometimes in digital too, you know, because after 20 whatever minutes or 40 whatever minutes, you're like, okay, well, I just want to get. No, we have to change the card, the disc, the tape, the. So you still end up there once in a while, you know, which is which is just the movie gods kind of giving it to you. Um, so, I think it doesn't. Yeah, I mean, because you also have, you know, you can just shoot film, too. You know, you can just go outside and just turn the camera on, which is great, right? There's a battery, a camera, and you're going, you're off. Um, and so there's not really anything kind of set. I mean, I, I think really it's just the difference if you've been experienced in them. If you walk onto a, a, a set that, um, you know, I'm sure some of the sets on Inception took some time to light. And, you know, but if you're used to that and then you go to a digital set, you might go, wow, this is really different. The rhythm's different, you know, waiting differently might feel different to you. Um, but then once it starts going, the process other than the time would just be up to the story and the filmmakers and what's happening. Um, uh, but to me, I, I have a little nostalgia. So I, I come, you know, I really love that moment when you walk onto, you know, just like, you know, flag heaven and at the time and you've got this moment a different kind of moment you know when you walk onto uh on that certain scale of filmmaking that's that's just amazing it's really um yeah it's a two minute drill but sometimes not i mean that can become an all day two minute drill you know i mean it might be you know get it until you're done it really depends on the scale of the production um you know, because you can still, you know, there's those stories, you know. They shot, you know, a million feet of film in two days, you know, 10,000 you know. Um, take after take. You know, so you still get that, you know, um, sometimes. But that's the only thing, it's just that, that thing of, there is a difference between walking on the floor in a green room, you know, and you got to pretend and you got to do that, to like when you walk in and you're seeing all of the layering, the texturing, the track, the size of it coming in, you know, and you're, you know, you're right in there and you're ready to go and it's live and, you know, someone says, action. <sighs> I don't know if you get that as much. It's, that's, a, that's a difference. I just wanted to, to, to comment on the different tools for different things. When I see the most impressive, you know, duo that's doing the digital work that I see up there, is Anthony Dodd Mantle, who's, who's a friend of mine, and Danny Boyle, who are really using that technology for something the film can't do. When you hear Anthony talk about taking that small camera, running through the streets and getting shots that you can't get with your 35 millimeter camera, your IMAX camera, um, and they're they're using it for a specific purpose, just as Noel and I are using IMAX for a specific perfect purpose. We want that high resolution to draw the audience in, and that what. You know, Anthony and, and uh, um, you know, Danny, we're going for is that intense visceral 
uh, uh, sort of experience that only a small camera can give you. And, and Anthony's fascinating in that way, and he shot film for many years as well, and, and he's not sworn off film, he's made a name for himself doing this sort of thing um, in Slumdog Millionaire and in, in, in um, uh, 127 hours as well. So it's a very specific tool for, for a very specific thing. What bothers me is when it's trying to compete with a film camera and, and we're trying to, to as, they, as they said with the Panavision camera, you know, Fincher's not wrong at all. You know, they just try to make it look like a Panavision film camera by, by making the hard drive on the top. And that's kind of silly and, and, and that's what turns off a filmmaker uh, like Fincher in that situation. Um, can, can we hear from someone that oh, yeah. hasn't spoken yet? Hi. Um, my question was about. Um, I've I've always been really interested in like in the editing process in general, and um, just the fact that it seems like now you know if you think about it like a relay race, and you've got like the first leg, second leg, third leg, and it gets to the editor, and all of a sudden like the editor has so much material to comb through. Um, does that does that aff do do you think that it's um, sometimes affects the quality? What am I trying to say? Okay, so if if you have so much leeway to get it absolutely perfect, it's kind of like when do you stop in a way? Um, and so if you have that much material, do you think that time constraints maybe affect the quality, or do you think it's more the reverse, where you sort of are driven to this point of absolute perfection, where you kind of don't know when to stop? Does that make sense at all? Yeah. Well, it. it it definitely makes sense to me. Um, well, I, I don't think your producers are ever going to let you go over a certain amount of time. So whatever you're shooting, you want to make your day. But we do have a tendency, because when you shoot film, you know, it is gold going through the camera. We do have a tendency to just keep the cameras rolling. You know, we I'm shooting a TV show, and we shoot with three cameras, and... I got to the point where I'm, I never say cut. I go, uh, let's reset, just do it again. So you, that you have a rhythm with the actors. And it has to be difficult for the editor because you know, when it comes in, now instead of, you're right, you know, there's 15 minutes worth of footage on the scene from three different cameras, so there's 45 minutes for one scene, now it may be, if you're shooting a film, now it may be double or triple that. So. I think it's important for your script supervisor to nail the takes that you want. You, and, you know, you just have to be more discerning while you're on set to help the whole process out, I think. Um, I, I just did a courtroom sequence last week in Dallas. And we had a director who, uh, we shot seven hours of dailies in 12 hours. Um, we did have three cameras, and I'm sure she covered every angle perfectly, and the editors will be able to cut it magnificently. But then another director came in and shot two hours of dailies, very similar sequence, because he just decided he got it, and he was comfortable, and we moved on, and there was a difference. The fact that you can do it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get better quality out of the material. Um, and of course, it puts uh, extra strain on the post process that that might not be acceptable in the budget. Uh, but that's certainly possible now to shoot a lot of footage. Go ahead. I mean, when we first started interviewing people, we really didn't know what the reactions were going to be. Um, and I, I think I, in my mind, I kind of thought it was going to break down at least, you know, generationally or people who had a lot of experience shooting on film were going to really dig in their heels or young people were going to say, you know, forget about film. I can take 5D and, and, you know, shoot for days for free. And pretty much right off the bat, it it didn't break down like that. And that, that was a surprise to me. Like Michael Chapman, who um, 
you know, Keanu interviewed who shot, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, shot Raging Bull. You know, he's like, I don't care what you can do with film. I don't, what, what can I do with my digital? I'm like, so you said, so, so have you shot a lot of digital? I've never shot digital, you know. He'd never shot digital, but he kind of didn't care. He didn't have nostalgia for film. He was just ready to, you know, move on to the next thing. And then we interviewed a lot of young people who were, you know, hadn't shot a lot of film, but really wanted that opportunity and really liked the way it looked. So it had more to do with just someone's personality, I think, rather than their experience or their age or, or something like that. How did it uh, end up? Was it, would you say it was 60-40 or, you know, in which direction? It was like 99 Wally. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I, I'm just kidding. It, it was, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It was, you know, yeah, Vilmos, pe people, people love film. I love film. Keanu loves film. And, but, but I think what a lot of people think is that it's inevitable that digital is taking a bigger chunk out of the market. And if you kind of want to go forward, especially if you're at a certain level of filmmaking or starting out, you kind of have to get on the, the bandwagon or at least understand what's, what's going on. And these guys are, are smart, you know, really smart, open-minded, great artists. And really, they're just looking for the, the best thing that, that they can use to, to tell a story and make an image. And I think what kind of inspired me watching it was how, how much all these guys actually cared about the image. They weren't about to just jump over to digital and say, ah, so what? Okay, here's the new thing. Let me use this. They're really concerned to make this new technology hopefully be as good as film, and they're not just going to let it go. And, and seeing that people cared that much, I don't know, it kind of made me feel good about, about the future and, and where we're Did going. Did anybody care more than Wally? Probably not. You know, the only thing I was going to say is that I do argue, continue to argue, and, and, and Nolan does as well, that there is an effect on the audience and that there's something in there. When I talk about the one, I can't believe you made me look as smart as, <laughs> I'm not very smart. Um, but when I talk about wanting to overexpose the film by five or six stops and still seeing something and they're underexposing it by the same, the same range and having something in there. You're playing in the subtleties there, you know? And whether or not most of the audience cares about it, whether or not they care whether the projector's dark or not, even if, you know, 5% of them care, that's sort of why, what we have to, the standard that we have to hold up to. And that's how Chris have always felt. And I've, I've always felt if they're paying, you know, $18 to see it at the Arclight, it's our job to put it up there in the best way. And for me, that gives me an enormous creative tool. If there's, if there's something in the storytelling that I'm enhancing and, and supporting uh, by still having a fragment of an image uh, when it's six stops overexposed, then that's a subtlety that might affect somebody in the audience. Wayne Fetterman. Uh, first of all, uh, this reminded me very much of that movie, Visions of Light. Did you see that movie, and did that inform this project at all? Yeah, uh, I had seen it. I'd seen it years ago, and right. of course, when we started out to make this, I we thought of that and remembered how much I enjoyed it. Um, you know, I think this is, ours is pretty different. Right. Um, well, there were some of the same players. And also I had a question about players, the, yeah. uh, the licensing of the film clips. Was that a problem or was that a thing or? Uh, well, let me, I'll finish the first question. So, yeah, Visions of Light is a great movie, an inspiring movie, and I love it and I'll, I'll watch it again and again. Um, and this does have the same players and similarities in that we interviewed a lot of DPs, but I think we took it a little yeah. bit further even in, in, you know, interviewing colorists and color timers and editors and kind of take anyone who was involved in the image at all, which, which is kind of what is a little bit different or a lot different about the digital age now. So many other people can possibly have access to manipulate and change the, the look of it. And that's Was there difference. digital when that film was made, when the visions? Visions of light? Was that all film? I don't know. That was in the... It was shot on film, yeah. Yeah, it was probably. Yeah, they didn't even discuss digital, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, how about our uh, video guy, our in house shooter? So, uh, my question then, in all relation to the 
relates back to a, an, an episode of House uh, on television. Uh, the, uh, the advent of these digital cameras, uh, like the GoPro, and some of these great small cameras that are coming out allow you to start shooting in places where you can't get these huge life-size style cameras inside the place. I, I shoot a lot of extreme sports. Being able to sh put all these great little cameras everywhere, uh, you could throw them into a pit of fire and get them out if you're lucky and get them out in time, but you can get these great shots. Um, how does that play into your level of vision when you're going to you know, set up shots now that you can you know, do 25 little digicams to get those shots out? I actually am embarrassed to admit I own two GoPros because <laughs> I think it's phenomenal technology and it's exactly what I was saying before about what Danny Boyle and Anthony Dodd Mantle are doing uh, in using the specific tool for the specific need and, and the GoPro is an amazing you know, bit of technology and, and great image quality. Um, would we ever end up using it on, you know, one of Chris Nolan's films? Likely not, until it, it gets gets to that level where it reaches that standard that that he he cares about. But I, you know, I'm, I'm going to digress a little bit because the only thing I wanted to talk about with the technology, because Chris touched on this a little bit, are all the other people involved, and well. Um, you know, David, I think, said something about, you know, the, the mystery that cinematographers had about uh, the image and everything else. It, 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 that was an important element for us because that was part of the respect that we got for, what, for collaborators as, as artists. And you can tell by, by hearing George Lucas that he's not really interested in that kind of collaboration. He wants to tell the DP how much backlight to put on somebody. And that's nev never how my relationship worked with Chris Nolan or any of the other directors that I work with over the years. They would they would come to you for for your uh, expertise. So it is it is a little bit scary even to have the colorist up there going, well, I can do this and I can do that, I can do that. Well, you notice she was alone in the room. The 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 vision of that film <laughs> belongs to the director and secondarily the cinematographer. It's the director's choice and the cinematographer for his job to do that. And then all the technicians work below us. It is a very structured military system um, in, in, in the way that it needs to work. There has to be a hierarchy, and the director is king. He's the, the, the king storyteller, and then the people around him you know, fall in. So when you add in so many more voices, the, the opportunity that perhaps the people that own the material, the studio, who don't really know what they're doing with the visuals can change that anytime they want and 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 it, it does get a little scary for us as purely as artists we don't own the material but we 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 put that stamp on the screen where there's a very particular way that we're exposing that negative to put it up on the screen and I'd rather just have it left alone once the director signs off on that image and not have 10 other people telling you what they can do power windows on and, and alter. There's one other component in that that's a little concerning to me uh, with technology in general and far more as a consumer than as a filmmaker but is our dependency on all these systems. And one of the difficult things that theatrical exhibition is facing right now is, is the, the dependency that these companies are going to place on them. You know, that film projector had that bulb that you would change every six months to a year, whatever it was. Uh, but now you have these electronics companies putting those projectors in there and going, oh, oh yeah, you're going to need that new software in January or else your projector's not going to work and <laughs> nobody's going to come to your theater. And it is scaring the hell out of exhibitors. It's becoming a really large threat. I, 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 my own personal experience in this is I have two Blu-ray players at home and they both don't work now. And I put the disc in and it spins forever and it just sits. I've been told that I need to up grade the software in order to play a disc on the machine. That kind of enslavement infuriates me. Okay. <laughs> so I think that's a danger. As, as somebody did mention, that piece of film, once that piece of film is authored, all you have to do is hold it up to a light. And I don't have to continuously pay Sony for the bulb in that light every time I want to hold it up against it.
it's a great, or, or Apple for that matter. Such a great point. Just, I'm going to hand it to Paul. But um, you know, this the GoPro question brings up: Why can't is there? Does it have to be one or the other? Can, is there any reason that it's, these are just tools, uh, storytelling tools, and why can't you, when you really want to immerse somebody emotionally, you use the film, and then you get it close enough so that you can, you know, use the GoPro to uh, get to another emotion that you wouldn't be able to get to with a film camera? And why can't we use both as tools? Why does it have to be one or the other, or does it? Well, the, the um, situation with the shooting for television, 1920 by 1080. GoPro only in the last couple of weeks gave us a 2398 upgrade so that we could shoot at the frame rate that we actually shoot at. But we've been waiting for that for a long time. But that camera now, the Hero 3, I've used a couple of them on a NASCAR track with variable results because there's so much vibration and rolling shutter issues because the camera's only 300 bucks. You could give up something and rolling shutter is what you give up. Have you ever seen that jello effect? you see a low resolution camera. But now they have the pixel count and they're claiming that they have a 4K version that will roll. So it's only a matter of time before they get there. I, I just want to make one comment because I have been, I completely transitioned. I, I would be, I have a meter in my box in the video village. I get it out every now and again if I need to do some matching. But basically I light with a waveform on my monitor and it's a whole new experience. The Alexa has taken me to new levels of shadow and dark retention of information that I could never have gotten out of film, I don't believe. And, and that has been amazing. And also, I can shoot at much lower light levels, fantastically lower light levels, so that the economics of my truck package has gone from a 40-footer full of lights down to a five-ton. And we really feel that we could probably get away with a Sprinter van but I do carry one 24,000 watt soft sun, just because we like big lights sometimes. But most of my shooting is done with LED, LEDs with battery lights now, one by one, light panels, and they are effectively very powerful lights because I'm working at one and two foot candles. Now we went into a bar the other night and shot existing light levels. I put one strip of LEDs in there, still 2.8 because I'm using zooms. And I think I went to 1600 ISO, and there's no way I could have got, done that in film. Now, Wally on prime lenses would go to 1.3 or 1.4 and probably get the same results, but at the speed of television, you can't really shoot prime lenses, so I, I have to work it for 2.8. But, so dynamic range has now come of age, I think, in digital, and will only get better. Aeroflex are probably going to release a 4K camera next at NAB. And uh, red is there, although I don't believe they have the same level of dynamic range. They certainly have resolution, so it's exciting times. Uh, I just I, I wanted to make a couple of comments. I'm first of all just really honored to be even sitting on this chair on the side w with you guys. Um, I think uh, the reason that Chris uh, invited me to moderate tonight is we uh, the the post production company I run called Cinelicious, where we're, we're um, one of the few new post companies that chose to heavily invest in film. That doesn't mean we only do film, we do digital really well, um, but we're, it puts us at the center of the conversation a lot with producers uh, who are trying to decide if they're gonna shoot on film or on digital. And um, I just wanted to speak for a quick moment to some of the indie people who may be in the crowd. Uh, we do a lot of independent film. Um, there's a perception that film is really expensive. Um, and it's gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. I don't know if, I, I'm not, not the stock itself, the stock somewhat, uh, but camera departments are willing to rent film cheaper. Um, scanners have come along, they're 20 to 30 times faster in some cases in 4K mode um, than they used to be, uh, certain, certain ones are. Um, there's an interesting statistic from Sundance, because um, this kind of speaks to what you were saying, Wally, about does film impact people differently? Um, Sundance this last year, there was 110 movies submitted, and uh, only 5% of them were shot on film. But out of that 5%, they won 100% of the awards in the dramatic com competition for uh, uh, US and world competitions, and both cinematography awards. Now, I'm not saying at all that those films were uh, won because they were shot on film, but did it help? Um, and so, if you're an indie producer, I mean, I, 
I don't know what the, the cost for us that we've been going. We have a Susan Sarandon movie going through right now. On they're Super giving 16. everything it's like, away. They're it's giving. a $600,000 movie shooting on film. Uh, we have another one that's $400,000 shooting on film. I, I, the numbers that I've seen in, in production, it's about 20%. So I'd love to hear from the audience if people are uh, I think, shooting on film or I if they're shooting on digital. I think the Southern Wild was shot on film too, Yeah, was shot, it? No, that's the one that I was referring to. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. It, it, the great thing that I've noticed now because I, I'm, we're going to do my film on film, big surprise. But but is is that these companies are just giving the equipment away. I, Panavision's giving them away dirt cheap. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, IMAX offered me free cameras to, to, to do portions of my film on, on IMAX. Um, the stock is definitely getting cheaper and cheaper. So maybe there will be these opportunities for, for people to explore it who otherwise didn't think they could afford to. And... Uh, and give people a chance to try it. I, I, I'm certain if you're teetering on the edge and not sure whether or it's intimidating to think about shooting a film, I would just talk to the folks at Kodak and, and Panavision and uh, as they claw for their last desperate <laughs> grasp in the market, I'm sure they'll help you out. Good storytelling is good storytelling, and and you know the celebration is a fantastic film, and it's and it's fascinating, you know, character study. Um, so I think that that in a strange way, if you're doing what I was doing in cinematography and working, of course, it, it's become it's part of the storytelling. But uh, the way that that Anthony Dodd Mantle used the small camera in Slumdog Million, Millionaire was part of the storytelling, but it was at a you know a lower resolution image. It didn't matter. It, it was it wasn't what it was all about. As he said, to capture the energy of Mumbai and to capture the energy of these kids running around, that was the the appropriate format to use. Can we, can we talk about archival for a quick second? How are you guys archiving your stuff? Well, the, I mean, the, uh, the television thing is interesting because all of the assets fit on about five terabytes and the studios can kind of handle that for every episode. So it's a manageable amount of footage. But every six months it has to go through an LTO conversion and be regenerated. And eventually it costs money. I, last time I heard it was like, Assets for a feature film in the salt mines were 400 bucks for a year, and the equivalent digital was around 15 grand by the time you did all the uh, captures for the completion guarantors at the standards that they required. It was basically bank vault, LTO, linear tape storage. Did you guys find anybody, did anybody have any solutions? Because to me, that's the horror movie part of the film. It's, you get to that and everything else is like, here's what's going on in the future. But suddenly, like, everybody's freaked out about that. I know Nolan is, it's a big concern. I have my own little example of that is, is material that, that, that we shot on three quarter inch and all these formats are, are they disintegrate. I mean, that's, that's a whole other thing. But some of these machines don't exist anymore, D2, you know, a lot of these formats that we were originally in. Also, it happens just with, with programs. I have a, a text program that I had my, my, all my documents in, and I can't open it up now. I don't know what format it was in. But does anybody have solutions that you know of? No, not really. Um, <laughs> you know, everyone says you, you, migrate, you migrate the footage to the, the newest tape LTO format or you make sure it go, keeps going on new drives or you have it backed up in different ways. But I mean, even for us, we're a, just a couple guy operation here at this point and other documentaries and things I've made also, you shoot a lot of footage. I don't have the money or the manpower to constantly update things. And you know, I have things I've shot on mini DV, they're just sitting on the tapes now. Or I have drives, but I don't even know if it has the right port to put into my newest, you know, computer. So, especially for small movies, it's a big problem. 
um, and for bigger films, you know, like if they have the infrastructure, they can they can keep migrating it and keep updating it. But I think film is still the the best way to archive. All right. Well, we'll start to wrap it up. Uh, you guys, uh, I'm sure uh, it's been a while. Uh, I can't thank you enough. Any uh, anything anyone else wants to say or speak to? Um, Chris, anything? <laughs> uh, any other questions to kind of wrap this up? Or maybe uh, we'll take one more. You guys okay on time for one more question? All right. Here. Meet me halfway. I, I'm just curious that if you guys were coming up now, would you still be into it? Would you still have the same passion for making films? I mean, if you're coming up in the digital age. I, I do. No, for shooting at all. The, the whole experience. Absolutely. It, you know, it's, it's, it's telling stories. For me, anyway, that's, that's where the passion comes from for me. And it would, if it's on film or digital or drawings on crayon, I think it'd be something I'd be interested in. Um, the, the process of, of telling stories in whatever digital or film is very similar. It's a very, very satisfying creative experience, and it's a collaboration. And I find in the digital realm that the collaboration aspect of it, certainly on set, is much more apparent. I, I have instant feedback. We're watching the final image, essentially. When, by the time I've cheated my monitor and done my, uh, my setups, I'm pretty well going to see that in dailies. So nobody actually watches dailies. That's a whole other problem. Uh, but we get, I get sent stills in the morning on my iPhone. I wake up and there's the dailies uh, that have come through and I use them for reference throughout the day. And there are many little tricks about it that just make it more satisfying. I could probably get that out of a film pass too. But uh, I do like having a first class monitor on set and we can all stand around and we can all agree that that's what we want to have happen. And, and that I think is a little bit different in film still where there's that magic and you're not quite sure and you, you probably don't have a problem. But I used to wake up some mornings and think, oh my God, I, last night with Kiefer in the dark and, oh, you know, and get into trouble. <laughs> all right. Anything else? We'll make everybody happy. We, we, these questions were so good here tonight, we didn't even go to Ustream. Sorry, Ustreamers, but I'm sure you were uh, captivated, as I was, and forgot to ask your questions. Oh, well, Ustream, uh, uh, they were going to feed it out. What's that? Well, yeah, we're live streaming this to uh, two people, I believe. <laughs> two, two people who have questions that I didn't get to. Uh, no, a lot of people are watching. So any, anything else? Well, thank you guys so much. I mean, what an amazing panel. What a treat. Thanks for coming. Um, and then if you uh, want any more information about IOLA, you can talk to me. We have some drinks back here. We can chat some more, continue the conversation. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. See you soon.